The Man in the Rubber Mask by Robert Llewellyn Chapter 1 In the giant control room in the sky, there are banks and banks of lights on a huge, smooth, black control board, each one connected to an emotion or a significant experience of a human being on Earth. If only we were aware of them, our lives would be transformed. If only I knew that my irony warning light had been burning so regularly over the last five years, they kept having to replace the bulb. The irony light was full on, I now see, when I was carrying the last bag of props down seven flights of stone steps in that Edinburgh apartment building. The warning light was on because I thought carrying seven bags of props was hard work. I thought life was tough and the rest of the world was sitting around chatting and having tea, having sex or sleeping off the copious poisons of a night's debauchery. How come, I thought, I was heaving great big boxes of heavy stuff about so early on a Sunday morning? It was the beginning of September in 1988, the end of the Edinburgh International Festival of Theatre, Music, Dance, Poetry, Opera, Jazz, Film, Television and Shagging. I always had the feeling that there was a lot of the latter going on in Edinburgh, in between all of the former. This was the time of the year when Edinburgh turns into a thespian village. The thespian village was a concept that an old lovey who made an opening speech at the festival club along the lines of Once a year the city of Edinburgh is turned into a giant thespian village. To which one embittered and no doubt hungover member of the audience mumbled wanker under his breath. Apart from shagging and thespians, there was an astonishing amount of drinking taking place. Astonishing for me because I don't drink very much. Half a pint of watered-down lager, and I'm performing a sad comedy strippogram on a barroom table before you can say, keep your dignity. If I drink a double whiskey, I'm transformed into a smiling human vomit cannon in about 30 seconds. So I stick to orange juice and very expensive mineral water. However, unlike most non-drinkers, I quite enjoy the company of drunk people. There are two bars open during the Edinburgh Festival where people I know lean against the wall and talk a lot. The assembly rooms and the gilded balloon. In the assembly rooms, we all stand around under huge posh chandeliers shouting and laughing in a loud show-off sort of way. All the time we're talking to someone, we are looking round the room hoping to meet someone really famous. It's a complaint called Edinburgh Neck, an involuntary spinal twitch which ruins any conversation and reduces all communications to gag tryout and witty put-down. The room is packed full of insecure, loudmouth performers, agents and TV executives. I love it. The Gilded Balloon Bar is slightly different. It is where the exact same crowd go when they're pretending they hate the Assembly Rooms Bar where they've just come from. I love doing that. I love going to the Gilded Balloon after I've been in the Assembly Rooms, twitching my head like a demented automaton, and then slagging everyone off for being so posy. Oh, I can't stand the assembly rooms. It's just utterly full of people looking round to see who's in. I mean, Lenny and Dawn walked in. That's Lenny, Henry and Dawn French, obviously. And everyone looked at them. I mean, it's pathetic. I said this to Arthur Smith, the man who played the barman in Backwards, and he said to me, oh, I met Lenny Henry once. Well, I didn't actually meet him. I saw him at a party. The Gilded Balloon Bar isn't quite as glamorous as the assembly rooms. It is in fact a narrow corridor leading to the toilet, but it will accommodate up to 170 very drunk comedians. Drunk comedians stand very close to you when they're in full flow. They tell you what you should do with your show, your life or your lover. By three in the morning, it can begin to look rather sad. And if you're not deeply relaxed after seven pints of designer lager, total cost £304.76p, then the next best thing is to head home. The final bag was stuffed into my small, rusty hatchback car, and we set off. I breathed in the crisp Scottish air and brewery fumes for the last time, little knowing that by the time I got 12 miles down the road, one of the new, super-cheap remold tyres I had bought to get the car through its MOT would tear apart like a wet paper bag in a wind tunnel. My two companions, Martin Popple, who directed the play I'd written, and Deborah John Wilson, whose brother is Yafet Koto, the black guy in the original Alien movie, sat on the side of the road laughing as I struggled to get at the spare wheel from under the monstrous amount of stuff we were carrying. By some fluke, the spare wheel was pumped up. I found a jack and a spanner, so after a few more comedy wheel-changing moments, we were on our way. The reason I had super cheap fell off the back of a lorry good as new tyres on the car was because I was skint, stony, brassy, cleaned out, poor as a church mouse, take your pick. This was my normal state of affairs. Nothing to worry about. I got by somehow. It was only odd because I'd just completed a sell-out run of a play I had written called Mammon, Robot Born of Woman. It had been nominated for the Perrier Award. 
and plays don't normally get nominated. Stand-up comics normally get nominated, so that meant it must have been good, even though it didn't actually win. Not that I cared, of course. I'm not competitive. I'm a thespian. I didn't care when Simon Fanshawe gave me a big hug in the bar of the assembly rooms and told me with barely concealed delight that I hadn't won. Robbie, darling, he shouted, you haven't won. Isn't it absolutely dreadful? Simon is a lovely, loud, gay comedian. He was a very big figure in the 1980s and wore even bigger glasses. OK, if I'm really, really honest, it would have been quite nice to win. But as soon as the play was nominated, it was packed to the roof. Even the bloke who runs the assembly rooms, Bill Coots, couldn't get in. He had to bring his own chair and sit behind the stage to watch. The play, Maman, Robot Born of Woman, was about a robot, as you can probably tell from the title. Not at all like Crichton, Mammon was supposed to be a robot who resembled a human to such a degree no one other than his maker could tell. It was sort of the Frankenstein story, mixed in with a bit of Robocop, a bit of Terminator and a few silly walks. The twist was that instead of the maker being a mad male scientist, she was a mad female scientist. Dawn Raid, played by Deborah John Wilson, was black and had made the perfect white man in order to enter the marketplace or the stock exchange and start making money. Remember, this was 1988, before Black Wednesday, Black Friday and that rather dull grey Tuesday morning in early April. At this time, there were still wide boys in the City of London pulling down 800k a year gross and thinking they were terribly clever. I was brought up to believe it was bad manners to laugh at other people's misfortune. But the day after Black Wednesday, I cycled through the City of London laughing my head off and pointing at sad, dejected-looking businessmen in their crumpled pinstripes. It was an amazing sight to see so many deeply unhappy, seriously rich people. In the story, Mammon made money on the stock market very successfully, but as he progressed, Dawn noticed he started to develop certain human characteristics. He was designed to blend in with his environment, which is what he did. He started to become like the men he worked with. Dawn, being a slightly mad scientist, takes the next step. She introduces Lust Mode 691, the ultimate in sexuality software, into Mammon's computer brain. At this point, Mammon copulated with everything on stage, including some members of the audience, unlucky enough to be seated in the front row. It was a disgusting spectacle, and it should have been banned. I remember thinking during those rare moments of speculative thought actors have during performing that it was an odd thing for a grown man to be doing. Pretend to copulate with a desk in front of 200 people in a small room in Edinburgh. Little did I know the irony warning light was flicking on the big control panel in the sky. I'd seen nothing yet. With a new super cheap remold tyre fitted to the super cheap car, we continued our journey south. I dropped Deborah off in Manchester, where she was staying with some friends, for a while to recover from the Edinburgh trauma. Next stop, Leicester, where I dropped off Martin, the man who directed Mammon, at his parents. We had a cup of tea and I asked him if the playwright of the family, Joe Orson, who came from Leicester, used to live near them. He didn't. I drove the last leg of the journey alone, arriving in London in the early hours of the morning, dumped all the props and bags in the hall, listened to the three messages on my answer machine from my mum, and collapsed into bed. One of the first things I did the following day was go through the press list to see who had come to see the play. During the hectic schedule of doing the show every day, getting in and out of the theatre in such a short time, meant that I only took the barest note of what people had said to me. All sorts of heavyweight, as in influential, not overweight, as in tubby, media people came to see the show, and as I scanned the list, I saw a name that I knew, Paul Jackson. I knew he did the young ones and loads of other things. He was one of those people who did a lot of stuff on telly. Other than that, I thought nothing of his attendance. The play had been commissioned as a six-part sitcom by Channel 4. Mammon was going to be on the small screen. That was what was really exciting. I had discovered this over lunch one day back in Edinburgh. Seamus Cassidy, then the head honcho for Mirthmakers at Channel 4, had seen the show and liked it. I'd worked with Seamus on a not-so-glowingly successful sitcom I co-wrote for Channel 4 in 1986 called The Corner House. This particular sitcom was made up of a great deal of sit and very little com. Ah, oh, well, we all have to fail sometime, but why so publicly? If an accountant fails, only he and one or two other people know about it. If a writer-slash-actor fails, everyone you know will have seen what you do and will agree loudly that you have failed. They will smile and say, You know, uh, your sitcom, The Corner House, it was on the telly last night, Bob. And I nod proudly, waiting for the praise. Yeah, you failed. You failed, Bob, they say sadly. You really, really failed. 
Therefore, Mammon's success was of great importance to me. I don't want to go back too far. But when my mum used to change my nappy... No, 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 that is too far. Just a couple of years back, before, before all this, I was in a four-man comedy, satire, slapstick and music group called The Joeys. I did that from 1980 until 1985, and it was very successful, considering we hardly ever appeared on telly. Anyway, that's another story. All I'm saying is that between 1985 and 1988, I'd been busy. But busy in a sort of cold, miserable, failure type of way, rather than a warm, glowing, success type of way. So Seamus Cassidy had commissioned me to convert Mammon into a six-episode situation comedy. It was great. I worked day and night on the scripts and storylines, developing the characters, introducing new ones, throwing the whole thing away and starting again. It was actually two years later that I discovered Channel 4 could never have afforded to make the series, but by then everything had changed beyond recognition. Mammon never made it to the small screen, not in the original way I'd intended anyway. But on July the 10th, 1989, about nine months later, the gestation period for babies and weird events, I locked my pushbike to a lamppost on the Charing Cross Road. I was going to have a meeting with Paul Jackson and some other blokes about some sort of part in some sort of sitcom. That's all I knew. I entered the little door at the old Noel Gay office and was met by Paul Jackson's braces and tie. As the glowing sensation settled in my eyeballs, I shook hands with the figure behind. Paul immediately showed me downstairs. I entered a basement office to see three men sat around a table. A tall, gangly, skinny one called Ed, and two slightly shorter, stockier ones called Rob and Doug. We talked about robots and funny walks and accents and trying to avoid all the old comedy robots, R2-D2, Marvin the Paranoid Android, and how to find another way of doing it. Looking back, it was the first time I experienced the Grant Naylor gaze. These four eyes which record every tiny nuance of your behaviour and start to reprogram it in their weird heads so two years later you find yourself in costume doing something oddly familiar. After this meeting, I realised what they were talking about. I had seen about three episodes of the first two series of Red Dwarf, but as I worked at night as a stand-up comic and actor, I missed a lot of telly. I knew Norman Lovett from the comedy circuit, and I knew he was in the series. We had worked together on various things over the years. In fact, my first ever experience of working in television was with Norman. It was on a Channel 4 show called, wait for it, this is what it was called, I promise you, Bookham and Risk It. It had the exclamation mark at the end of it like that, Bookham and Risk It. Brilliant. This program presented the talents of people like Norman, Ben Elton and the Joeys, the group I was in. The idea behind the programme was that because we were aspiring young performers, we would do anything to get on a telly show. We were supposed to be storming the entrance lobby of a TV company and doing the show right here. The director, Mr Brian Izzard, no relation of Eddie, would not contradict me, I think, if I said he was not Britain's leading non-sexist man. A charming and hard-working individual who'd been in the business many years, Brian dealt with me very kindly when I tried to point out to him that the Joeys were trying to create a new form of non-sexist, non-racist humour, and we really didn't like his references to secretaries with big tits, etc. He put his arm round me and stared into the middle distance. With a tight smile, he said, I still love you, Robert, but you do your job and I'll do mine. Off you go. Still love you, darling. With that, he gently pushed me away and got on with his job. As the rehearsals continued, Norman, who I'd only just met, seemed to get even more depressed. He really wasn't happy about something, presumably being called a child by the director. Mr Izzard had a habit of saying, Come along now, children, to the cast, whose ages ranged from 19 to 50. As we were doing some sort of blocking and confusing rehearsal, Norman said something like, Saw this for a lark, and walked out, never to be seen again. He didn't miss much. The show went out early in Channel 4's history and thankfully sank without trace. I saw Norman regularly over the next few years. One very memorable time was when I was compare at a comedy club in Woolwich, South London, called The Tram Shed. Just before I went on stage to announce him, Norman asked me to time him from when he went on stage to when he first spoke. I nodded, not really understanding what he was asking. I went onto the stage and said, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together in a warm and supportive manner for the very wonderful Mr Norman Lovett. The crowd went bananas and Norman sloped onto the stage, looking slightly moth-eaten and miserable. He stood behind the microphone. The clapping died down. The room became quieter as the audience waited for the first gag. Norman stood there in silence. Someone laughed. 
Norman looked at them. The whole audience laughed. He looked at the whole audience. They laughed again. Norman hadn't uttered a sound. I was looking at my watch at the side of the stage. Two minutes. The other comics on that night crowded around at the back of the room. They knew Norman was going for his record. He stood motionless, picked out by the single spotlight. The audience went silent again. Not a sound. Norman stared at them. It was a comics nightmare, standing there in utter silence. Then someone snickered. Norman gave the person the most cursory of glances, and immediately the whole audience started laughing again. Four minutes. He'd been standing on the stage in front of three hundred people for four minutes, entertaining them somehow by doing absolutely nothing. It was very funny. It was utterly infectious. Even the hardened old pros at the side of the stage were roaring with laughter. There must have been ten periods of nerve-wracking silence, each one broken by someone bursting out laughing, looking at this gaunt, miserable bloke standing on the stage wearing a cardigan. At seven minutes twenty seconds, after a huge, prolonged wave of laughter, Norman said, "What?" and got an ovation. I'd seen Norman's face on a screen on the wall of some sleeping quarters in a sitcom set in space with Craig Charles, who I'd seen in the bar of the assembly rooms in Edinburgh. I'd rubbernecked as I was talking to someone else. I thought, "There's that bloke, the one who's married to that woman who was in Mona Lisa with Bob Thingamy." Then I looked at the woman sitting next to him. It was that woman from Mona Lisa with Bob Thingamy. There was another man with an H on his forehead. I recognised him too. It was Chris Barry. I'd seen him at the comedy store years before, doing amazing impressions. Oh, extraordinary, David Colburn. Then another man came in. He had amazing clothes on and big teeth. He was called Cat. I didn't know him. I'd never seen him anywhere. That's because I hadn't been to see three hundred West End musicals. Danny John Jules had already found Divadom in. About three weeks after I went to meet Rob, Doug, Ed, and Paul Jackson, I drove to the BBC Special Effects Department in Acton. I didn't know what I was letting myself in for. I was, like most of the world's population, a prosthetic virgin. If only I'd been aware of the irony warning lights flashing in the heavens when I'd spoken to Rob and Doug. I had explained to them that I was slightly concerned about playing a robot or a mechanoid because I was midway through developing a series for Channel Four about a robot, and I didn't want to get typecast. Rob and Doug assured me that it wouldn't be a problem. They thought that very few people would recognise me. I think it's important to remember that I was very reassured by this. When I say important, I mean to keep the concept of this importance in context. It wasn't very important in the grand scheme of things, like it wouldn't be very important to someone in northern Thailand or in the Horn of Africa. It was only important to me for about a minute, which isn't very high in a world ranking of important things. I entered the special effects room and was greeted by Peter Rag, the master, the genius, the man behind Thunderbirds, Doctor Who, and who knows what else, the quiet, retiring head honcho of BBC special effects. Oh, this shouldn't take too long, Robert," he said. "We're just going to cover your head with dental alginet and about fifteen pounds of plaster bandage. Do you want a cup of tea?" He led me through rooms where men in white overalls were making exploding chairs for Noel Edmonds' big, big breakfast show. This was the room they made the Daleks in. The Cybermen's Wellingtons were sprayed silver in this very building. Everywhere I looked, there were old rubber monsters, slathering beasts with eyes on stalks. There were severed heads and rubber arms, model spaceships and boats, men sitting at benches sawing small bits of metal. We entered a room white with plaster dust, where I met Beth Ann Jones, who was head of the Red Dwarf makeup department. She was Welsh, and as soon as I walked into the room, she said, "I knew you weren't really Welsh. I thought you'd be fake Welsh." I took great umbrage at this fake Welsh with a name like Llewellyn. How could she? Of course, the truth is that I'm about as Welsh as a croissant. But somewhere in my past, there must have been a couple of taffs. Peter and Beth Ann Jones discussed my head. Peter pointed at the bridge of my nose with a pen.、Uh, if we can carve in here quite steeply, he said, we'll get a better shape in the forehead. What were they going to do? Put my head in a vice and get out a chisel? I wanted to look at the small print in my contract. I could see it clearly in my mind's eye. Why hadn't I taken a closer look at this? Section four A, subsection F nine, clause eighteen: The artist shall render his head, face, and all areas above the throat to the company for modification, enhancement, and radical change. All surgery costs and corrective therapy needed after the production to be paid for by the artist. I didn't remember reading that bit. As I sat in the chair, which was placed in the middle of the room, I was assured by Peter Rag that I wasn't about to have radical surgery. 
Some people, said Beth Ann Jones as she stuck a rubber bald cap over my hair, go completely mad when their heads are covered in plaster of Paris. Do you think you'll be all right, Robert? Llewellyn? I didn't know how to answer. It was a bit like being told some people die when they have a steamroller drive over them. Do you think you'll survive? Having never had my head covered in plaster of Paris bandage before, it was difficult to judge. I don't think I was claustrophobic. I'm a pretty well-balanced sort of guy, most of the time. As my body was wrapped in black bin bags, I began to get the distinct impression I wasn't going to have a lot of choice in the matter. I was going to get covered whether I went mad or not. Here's a pad of paper and a pen, said Peter, handing me the same. This is in case you need something scratching when you're under. Just write down which bit is itching, and we'll try and scratch it. Then put a tick if we get it right. You see, you won't be able to speak, hear, see, or smell anything while you're under. I gripped the pen and paper as if they were my last hope. We start with a mouth and nose, said Peter, who was now mixing a large plastic bowl full of bright yellow stuff which looked a little bit like putty. This is alginate, the stuff I make dental moulds out of. It's quite minty in taste but it is a bit cold when we first put it on. I nodded in the special way I've developed when I don't understand anything but want to appear that I do. We cover your nose and mouth first, then you blow through your nose and we make a little hole for you to breathe through. We need it to actually go in your mouth so you can keep your mouth open very slightly, all right? As I nodded yes, Peter slapped a great big handful of this minty gloop right in my face. It was very cold. It covered my nose, went into my mouth, forced my lips apart, ran over my teeth, settled around my tongue, and went sort of rubbery hard. It was like eating minty custard that went solid as you ate it. It was like being covered in semi-solid toothpaste. It was like nothing else I had ever experienced. They covered my eyes next, then my neck, ears, the top of my head. Their voices became muffled. All the sound was distorted as I felt something heavy and wet being slopped on top of the minty, rubbery goo. I assumed this would be the plaster of Paris bandage. I felt a lot of rubbing and scribbling about. My head started to get heavier. All I could hear was my breathing, all of which was taking place through one nostril, which naturally, after a few minutes, started to itch. And I mean itch. Like the itch at the centre of the universe. What can I do? It must only have been seconds, but it seemed like ages. My whole consciousness was focused on this itchy nostril. I tried to wipe it from my brain. I tried to think about sex, car crashes, mountain streams in the dappled sunlight, wide open seascapes, the mountains outside Vancouver, anything except this damn nostril. Then I remembered the pen and paper I was holding in my sweaty little hands. I wrote as best I could, seeing as the whole thing was done by touch, N-O-S-T-R-I-L-I-T-C-H. I heard muffled noises and movements around me. I couldn't tell what was going on until suddenly I felt something poke up my nostril. I found out later it was one of those blue makeup removal things with cotton wool spun on each end. It did the trick. The relief was monumental. In the normal course of events, an itchy nostril is hardly something you comment on. You don't call a halt to a conversation and say, Hold it, wait, I've got an itchy nostril, everyone stay calm. You just rub it, pick it, flick it and be done with it. Not so when your head is encased in seven pounds of plaster of Paris. My steady, regular breathing continued. In, out, in, out. I became super aware that I was an animal, that I had lungs which were two big bags which had to fill with air and then blow it out again. Then I could hear my pulse. Thrub, thrub. I could almost see my heart, this funny pumpy thing which keeps going day and night until I pop my clogs. How does it know? Why doesn't it just forget to beat? Why don't I just snuff it? I felt my heart rate increase. Thrub, 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 thrub. I felt a small rush of adrenaline. Maybe I would die with this bloody thing on my head. Maybe they wouldn't be able to get it off, and I would starve to death slowly. I'd never see anyone again. My girlfriend, my mates, my mum and dad. It was all over. I could see the headlines. Princess Di has ladder in tight shock. Let's face it, who would write about some sad actor who starved to death inside a plaster of Paris head mould in the BBC special effects department in Acton? I tried to control these maddening daydreams. I tried to think about sex, great big heaving, pulsating, sweating. No, it didn't work. It was a big shock. Never before in my life had I been unable to have a kinky sexual fantasy. I'd had them during school exams. I'd had them when I was failing my driving test. I'd had them when I was having sex. But now, not a sausage. In fact, a sausage would have been about the kinkiest thing I could have thought about. What a breakthrough, though, for sex offenders. They get sentenced to ten hours a day with their heads cased in plaster of Paris. 
It just stops all that stuff. Well, it did for me. Maybe it wouldn't work for everyone. I don't believe there are edges to human sexuality. I bet there's some bloke somewhere who is rock hard for Plaster of Paris. I bet there's a magazine you can buy in an Amsterdam bookshop called Kinky Plaster of Paris Monthly. Well, it's not so daft. I've seen a magazine called Enema Digest. I don't want to go on about Plaster of Paris forever, but there were the Chicago Plastercasters, weren't there? This was a team of young women artists in the late 1960s who went around making plaster casts of famous rock stars' erect penises. Firstly, they encouraged the erection, in whichever manner was most appropriate, and then they covered the appendage with plaster of Paris. Once it had set, they removed the mould and filled it with wax and a bit of string and made candles out of them. Oh, all right, I admit it, I tried it. I saw this documentary about mad American sex therapists which had a section about these women. I was young. I was impressionable. I went home and tried it, all right? I had a bit of plaster of Paris left over from building hills for my model railway set. I was halfway through the process. I don't want to go into details, but it did seem to be working. When suddenly my mother called to me from downstairs that it was tea time. I quickly tried to remove two and a half pounds of semi-hard plaster from my semi-hard manhood. I had forgotten one vital element. The Chicago plaster casters used a plastic sheet with a hole in it to avoid the plaster of Paris getting caught on the model's pubic hair. OK, OK, it's all gone a bit gross, I know, but anyway... I hadn't thought about that particular aspect of this operation. There is no real way of describing the pain that comes from hanging two and a half pounds of plaster of Paris from three or four pubic hairs, but let's agree that it is intense. I was panicking. I knew my mum was going to walk into my bedroom and I was going to suffer some fairly hefty adolescent humiliation. Luckily, I had a pair of nail scissors on my bedside table and with a bit of judicious snipping, I managed to remove the offending rock. I did eventually make a wax mould of my downstairs department. It looked like, well, you know when you clean out the vegetable rack and you find a six-month-old carrot that has dried up and shriveled? It was sad, and it took me many years to get over. I was still under the plaster mould at the BBC Special Effects Department in Acton. This state of affairs seemed to go on for hours. My ears were straining for any sound. I couldn't hear anyone. I imagine Peter Rag and Beth Ann Jones and the lads had all gone out into the sunshine. They were sitting on the steps, smoking and drinking tea, reading the papers and chatting about football. I imagine Peter Rag saying, We could all go down the pub if you like. We've got to wait a couple of hours for it to go off. Not much we can do, really. Suddenly, there was a cracking sound. A deafening, creaking, wrenching noise, as if the very bowels of the earth were being ripped asunder. I felt my head move, not much, just a judder, and then the pressure on my face was suddenly gone. After a little more creaking, there was a huge relief on my neck. The enormous weight of the back half of the mould was lifted away, and I could suddenly hear. Tip your head forward, Robert, said Peter Rag. We'll ease the mask off slowly, then wriggle your face a bit. I did as I was told, and slowly the mask moved. I could see light again. The minty lump was dragged from my mouth, and I emerged back into the real world. That wasn't too bad, was it? said Beth Ann Jones with her jaunty Welsh accent. Not too bad in comparison to being strapped to the underside of a battle tank on manoeuvres through a bramble patch at top speed. No. That's what I thought. What I said, of course, was, no, it was fine. I said that because I'm a well-brought-up person, or as Craig would say, a softy, middle-class bastard. They peeled the ball patch off and I had a wash, rubbing life back into my face. I returned to the casting room to see the plaster cast of my head emerging from the mould. It looked like the head of some sort of plug-ugly alien with bad posture. My neck had collapsed under the weight. My head was shunted forward so far I looked like a hungry giraffe. I couldn't believe it was me. I had a sideways nose, a double chin and a bumpy head. There was another warning light on the control panel in the sky. The small print beneath read... It's not over yet. Next, I had to stand in between two supports on which I rested my arms and have a body cast. This is where the whole torso and upper arm area of the victim is wrapped in plastic cling film, then covered in plaster bandage up to a weight of several tons. It is not an intellectually stressful task. You have to stand up, stay still and shut up. I was moaning and complaining as the plaster overcoat got heavier and heavier and my feet started hurting. If you've never stood absolutely still for a long time, it's difficult to imagine how something so simple could be so bloody uncomfortable. 
When you wait for a bus or stand looking at a painting, as I'm sure many of you do, you are actually flitting about like a bird, constantly shifting your weight from one foot to the other, scratching your bum and tapping your feet about. When you have to stand still, not move a muscle, it takes about 40 seconds before you become uncomfortable. Three minutes to be internally whinging, and after 20 minutes you can bore anyone to death with your list of complaints. I'd learned this many years before when a friend talked me into posing in her life drawing class. I had to stand in funny positions without a stitch on so that a lot of quite normal looking people could draw my bits. Well okay, they usually drew the rest of me first, but I was convinced they were really interested in my bits. After only a few moments, what had started out as a very comfortable pose would become agony, and it was always made worse when the teacher said, only another 35 minutes. They liked drawing me because I was so thin in those days, it was almost like drawing a human skeleton. Their other favourite model at the time was the opposite, Mr. Lard Mountain, they called him. I never met him, but I saw the drawings. He was big. I mean fat big, but also big big. He was big everywhere. All their drawings corroborated this. It made me very depressed. I was 21, and that sort of thing is of prime importance then. Normally it was quite warm in the life drawing class, although sometimes in the winter it would get a bit chilly and the old single Polaroid tended to turn into a passport photo. Except one time. Oh, I shouldn't tell you. Ah, but what the hell. Okay, I was modelling, that's what they call it, at the Royal Academy in London. Dead posh, proper art students, really old building, proper teachers. I even got to lie on a bed. They had this amazing bed with things like car jacks under each corner that could lift and tilt the bed into any position. All I had to do was lie on it, and they wiggled me around into the position they wanted. It was so warm and comfy, I was very happy. I was being paid to lie still on a comfy bed. I started to nod off. I felt sensual and warm, happy and fulfilled. The room around me disappeared, and I entered a gentle, loving place. After a while, I started to sort of wake up, because I sensed something had changed. There was a different emphasis going on in my lower groinal area. I opened one eye and glanced down in the downstairs direction. It was, of course, the worst possible thing that could happen. A double Polaroid right in front of 30 art students. Some of them girls. In fact, most of them girls. I thought about dustbins. I knew that's what you were supposed to do in such situations. The trouble was, dustbins made me think of having filthy, kinky sex in a dustbin. That was no good. I tried car engines, oily sex under a car engine, football, muddy sex on a football field. It was hopeless. I was desperate to try and flick a bit of cloth over it, but it was no good. Eventually, when the teacher called a break in the class, I rolled off the bed and pulled my trousers on pretty damn quick. No one uttered a word about it. I took a cursory glance at some of the students' work. They hadn't drawn it. There was a bit of rubbing out where they'd moved it a bit on the page, but they'd stayed well within the bounds of flaccidity. I found out later that it was a daily occurrence, and that no one had even noticed. Then I got depressed. Because no one had noticed, there's no pleasing some people, is there? Years later, back in the BBC Special Effects Department in Acton, Peter Wragg calmly kept applying Plaster of Paris bandage, smoothing it in and building up odd little ridges, which would help when it had set and he'd removed it. The relief when this great lump of stuff came off was immense. I felt light as a feather, but was again depressed at the sight of this pot-bellied hunchback torso that, in my mind, was a lightweight version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. After having my hands moulded, which was the least difficult, and being measured to bits, I was allowed to go. Surprisingly enough, looking back, I still really had no idea what I was letting myself in for. Chapter 2 Just around the back from the BBC's special effects department in Acton is the BBC rehearsal rooms. You can see them clearly if you drive down the A40. It's a big yellowish tower block which dominates the surrounding semi-industrial flatlands and cemeteries. As you go in the front door, there's one of those blackboards in the foyer with the white letters you can push in. This tells you what's going on, who's on what floor and which room. Red Dwarf was on the fifth floor with the cast from Blackadder on one side of us and You Rang, My Lord, on the other. Alexi Sale was down below us and Jim Davidson was there somewhere, I think. Or was it Jimmy Tarbuck? Or Paul Daniels and his wife? Oh, it was marvellous. A thespian village transformed into a tower block. I took the lift to the fifth floor and found my way to our room. There was a little blackboard outside the door, and written in chalk it said, Red Dwarf 3, Director Ed By, Producer Paul Jackson. 
I pushed open the big double door and saw that I must have been very late, as there were about twenty people sitting round a big table in the middle of a vast room. I wasn't intimidated. I'm an actor. I said hello in a high-pitched, nervous voice and tried to find somewhere to sit. I was introduced to so many people; it was hopeless. There was no way I would remember all these people, and I was going to be working with them for the next ten weeks. Some of them I recognised: Beth Ann Jones from makeup, Peter Rag from special effects, Rob and Doug, Ed By, and there was Hattie Hayridge. I knew her; I'd known her for ages. We did stand-up comedy gigs together. I shook hands with Chris Barry. How do you do, sir? He said in a fairly formal manner. I shook hands with Danny John Jules. Yeah, how's it hanging, guy? He said with a big grin. I shook hands with Craig Charles. What are you looking at, you middle-class bastard? No, I lie. He didn't say that at all. That wasn't until I'd been there for a whole week. He said something like,、uh, "Nice to have you on board," and then he bowed very low. Hattie looked very glamorous and settled, as if she'd been there for weeks. Hello, Hattie. I said nervously and tried to sit near her. In the middle of the table was a big pile of scripts. We were at the read-through, the first time each series when Rob and Doug get to hear the cast saying their words. That first read-through was pretty bad for me. Chris and Craig are such good sight readers. Hattie is very good, but I was very bad at that time. Danny, on the other hand, has a unique style when he first reads a script. He seems to be scanning through different pages to everyone else. Sometimes he's even looking through a different script. Sometimes he's not even looking at the script. He's reading about how much Pavarotti earns in a newspaper. It gets to his line, and the room falls silent for a moment. Danny looks around him with a big grin on his face. He's happy. Danny, it's your line, man," says Craig. "What?" says Danny. "It's your line, man," says Craig.、Uh, page thirty-two, Dan," says Chris. "Oh yeah," says Danny, finding the page. He clears his throat and says his line, which is, "What's happening?" Everybody laughs a great deal, and the reading continues. The first time this happened, Hattie and I were out of the picture. We didn't understand the long history Danny already had with the company. It would appear to the casual observer that Danny had no idea what was going on. He would smile and look around when it was his cue, and Craig would do his line for him. Then put him in front of an audience, and he is always on cue, always getting the laugh, or as Danny would say, "kicking comedy booty guy." I read terribly that first day. I suddenly felt completely out of my depth. I was sitting around a table with a group of people who all knew each other well and who had been working in television for years. I had been working as a performer for years, but with only limited experience of TV. I wasn't even playing a human. I was playing a mechanoid called Crichton. I didn't know what he was supposed to be, what he looked like, where he came from, why he was there. I didn't know anything. At that time, I'd never seen the episode in the second series where Crichton first appeared. At that time, Crichton was played by David Ross, who later became Talky Toaster, and who put in a magnificent performance as the headmaster in Alan Bleasdale's GBH. I read Crichton in my own voice, and what were very funny lines came out about as amusing as dog poo. At the end of a marathon read, six half-hour scripts, all of which took longer than that to read, it was hard for me not to be a little despondent. It seemed like such a mammoth task ahead, all these thousands of words to learn, and I hadn't written them. This was the part that was so different for me. I had spent the previous ten years learning lines almost as I had written them. I had written everything I had ever performed, except once when I was in a play at the Sheffield Crucible Theatre called "The True Story of the Titanic." It was a sort of musical comedy satire thing, equating the sinking of the Titanic with Thatcher's Britain. I played about six different characters, had loads of lines to learn, which were written by somebody else, and I found it very hard. The director would happily verify that I had trouble learning my lines. His name is Stephen Daldry. He was a scruffy git in those days. Now he's gone all posh. He ran the Royal Court Theatre in London. He's directed a couple of films you might have seen. Billy Elliot. I keep seeing him on the telly, winning awards for amazing plays he's directed. He dresses very smartly and has a nice haircut. But when he was trying to get me to do a dance piece and say lines at the same time, his abilities in coaxing a performance out of an actor were stretched to the limit. Maybe I helped him though. You know, maybe after he'd been through this difficult experience with me. He was a stronger, better director. After seeing me trip over and forget my lines eight hundred times in rehearsal, every other actor he would work with would be a breeze. To give myself a small break, I never blew it in a performance, though. And in that respect, I'm like Danny. 
give me an audience, and I can remember things my day-to-day brain would find utterly incomprehensible. The play in Sheffield was performed by what I refer to as proper actors. These are people who've been to drama school and done proper acting training, have learned how to absorb lines, learned stagecraft, understand music and dance, can do proper singing. I was in a musical theatre group for five years. I just used to mouth along with the songs most of the time. Then it looked like I was singing, but it sounded much better. The cast of Red Dwarf, however, were not proper actors in those terms. As I said, I came out of the alternative comedy brigade of the late 70s and early 80s. Craig Charles started life as a performance poet. Chris Barry I first saw doing impressions in a late night comedy club. Hattie does devastatingly funny deadpan comedy routines. Danny was in Cats, Starlight Express and loads of other musicals as a dancer. Danny has those proper dancer's legs. You know, the ones with massive calves that can spring him eight feet into the air. That was my problem. Before going to the read-through, I had reassured myself that I was working with a group of people who were more like me. Not proper actors, but renegade comics who wouldn't be able to read scripts well the first time. I was very wrong. As soon as the read-through was over, everyone got up and started talking to each other. I went to the special BBC tea table, which all those rehearsal rooms have. As I was making myself some tea, Beth Ann Jones asked me if it would be all right to try on my head, as the first mask was ready. I agreed. Rob and Doug came up to me, and we talked about what Crichton should sound like. I said that I didn't want him to be English, because then he was bound to sound like R2-D2. Or was it C-3PO? Anyway, the humanoid one who said, Oh, no, Master Luke. It would be so easy to say, Oh, no, Master Dave, and end up having a totally unoriginal robot on your hands. Rob smiled and smoked. Doug walked in little circles, nodding and saying, Yeah, 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 no. What about a walk? said Rob. The walk, the moment I'd been dreading. When I first met Rob and Doug weeks before, they'd been sitting down behind a table. I was showing them my full range of comedy walks, which they seemed to admire. By the time of the read-through, though, I knew Doug had a false leg due to an accident when he was a kid. His walk is obviously affected by this, so my desire to do a comedy wobbly robo-walk was somewhat hampered. I had done a great many comedy walks in my time. In fact, one kind reviewer had once written, Llewellyn's funny walks put John Cleese to shame. Well, I never like reviews which compare one performer to another, and they certainly didn't put John Cleese to shame. I mean, let's face it, had John Cleese been in the audience that night, I don't think he'd have got up out of his seat after seeing my funny walk and said, That's it. I'll never perform again. I feel put to shame. That's not a very good John Cleese impression, but let's leave that. My lack of desire to start comedy walking certainly wasn't Doug's fault. It's painfully clear he didn't give a toss about it. It was all my own inner, middle-class, guilt-ridden rubbish getting in the way. The big problem with comedy walks is that they invariably mimic someone who is disabled in some way. It's a problem with a lot of character comedy. You are often imitating someone who isn't normal in the dull grey sense of the word. You are being someone who is a bit bonkers, or a tosser, or a sad old git. But comedy walks have a specific danger all of their own. When on tour with the Joeys during a get-in in in the theatre in Swansea, I did my Douglas Bader comedy walk to pass the time and keep up the morale of my co-performers. Douglas Bader was a fighter pilot in the Second World War who lost both legs in plane crashes, but went on to learn to walk again. He had a very specific walk. It's the only way you can walk if you keep both knees straight and don't flex your ankles. You have to get all your movement from your lower back and pelvic girdle. A lot of men don't think they've got a pelvic girdle. They think a girdle is a lady's thing. But we do have them, which proves that all men are a bit girly anyway. So there I was, doing my Douglas Bader walk across the stage. My fellow performers and road manager were egging me on, thinking it was all terribly clever and funny. Then a charming old man came in at the back of the theatre and stood still for a moment. He called out, Would you like some tea? We waved and said we'd love some. Then I watched in horror as this man turned with great difficulty and walked out. He did a Douglas Bader walk. He had no legs. Well, he had two false legs. He'd been watching me do my funny walk, probably thinking I was taking the piss. I felt, well, let's say I flew over the pit of utter shame in a hang glider with no canvas. Pulling faces or gurning can be a dangerous occupation as well. Another kind reviewer once said, Llewellyn's facial gymnastics have to be seen to be believed. I like that one. Facial gymnastics. Nice one. Had that one put on the poster, I can tell you. But there is a downside to facial gymnastics as well. In one Joey show, there was a sketch about the law lords. It implied Britain's top judges were like mummified relics from a bygone age. I played the mummy, which involved funny walks and a great deal of highly energetic facial gymnastics. 
One night in a theatre in Canterbury, I think, we had a brilliant audience, half of which came from a local special school. They were amazing, loving every minute of the show and screaming for more. However, there was one guy in the front row who didn't have a lot of control over his face, and when I walked forward being the judge, I noticed him looking at me. To portray a 3,000-year-old mummified judge, I was distorting my face in an unnervingly similar way to him. I felt terrible. Then he burst out laughing and pointed at me. I didn't take much comfort from this at the time, but on reflection there is no reason on earth why my face shouldn't have been just as funny to him as it was to anyone else. It's a difficult area, and one I'm useless at. I always seem to blow it by trying to be too careful. In fact, the year Mammon was running in Edinburgh, I met a wonderful man called Jag Pla. Jag is an Indian stand-up comic who can only just stand up. He has been disabled from birth. He stumbles onto a stage, which takes some time, and advises the audience to talk among themselves while he gets to the microphone. He then grabs the mic stand and drops his crutches. He looks at them lying on the floor and says, Look at them. They're useless without me. I learned a great deal from being with Jag. One of the main things being that if you ignore someone's disability, you're not being honest with them. You're pretending there's nothing wrong. He would always confront able-bodied people's discomfort head-on. We once went out to eat in a restaurant in Edinburgh that had a steep flight of steps to the entrance. As we were leaving, a young Canadian couple in tartan shirts were waiting to go in. As soon as they realised Jag was on crutches, they looked away. I suppose in the belief that they would embarrass him with their stares. I could suddenly see what it must be like to be studiously ignored by everyone who sees you. Jag responded by shouting, Stand back! Crip coming! The Canadian couple winced. To hear the term crip coming from someone like Jag obviously jangled their liberal nerves. But to ignore him was to be more offensive than calling him a crip. When Jag spoke or walked, it was painfully clear that it was more effort for him than for most other people. That was all. In every other respect, Jag was a bog-standard, egotistical, male stand-up comic who lechd after women. One difference was he didn't drink. He claimed in his comedy routine that if he drank alcohol, he felt completely legless. I should have been super cool about Doug's leg, but I didn't know him then, and I felt very uncomfortable. I decided to go for broke, though, and suggested I would base Crichton's walk on a kid I was at school with. He had muscular dystrophy, a wasting nerve disease, but at the age of 15 he was still able to walk. He was the hero of our class, mainly because he was so funny. Kids can be really horrible about that sort of thing, but for some reason our class had really taken this boy under their wing. If he answered a teacher's question, he would put his hand up by swinging his shoulders and flicking his arm up, and then holding his elbow with the other hand. This style of attracting the teacher's attention quickly caught on, and soon we were all doing it. I think it had a beneficial influence on the whole class. We were the bad lads of the school in the problem class, because putting your hand up to answer a question was such fun, we started to pay attention. This boy's walk was also very peculiar. He would flick his legs forwards with a twist of the hips, sort of like Douglas Bader with rubber knees. When I perambulated across the floor like this for Rob and Doug, they clearly liked what they saw. Doug walked around in a circle, nodding and saying, No, no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Rob smoked another five cigarettes and said, Very funny, Bobby. Ed By wanted to know what sort of voice I was going to use. I searched my brains for all the daft comic characters I'd done over the year. Toby, the chinless wonder upper-class twit with buck teeth. Sir George Sprout, the gout-ridden old landowner. The boy Tom, the ancient rustic know-all. Steve Kresh Ponytail, the massively right-on non-sexist man, none of them fitted the bill. I tried my Dutch hippie accent, oh, hello there, and then I tried my Scandinavian, oh, there we go, ditch is very nice. It was a character I'd used in my stand-up comedy set who talked about having sex on a beanbag in a striped pine living room with a Janis Joplin poster on the wall. Oh, it was all very droll at the time, but it doesn't work out of context. This accent tickled Ed. It has a daft sing-song quality to it, a charming innocence or stupidity, depending on your viewpoint. As I did the walk and the voice, the general consensus seemed to be settling on Crichton being a Swedish mechanoid. Very clean and tidy, very Swedish, a sort of Volvo robot with side impact bars. It felt good. I seemed to have cracked it. Then Rob and Doug started walking around, standing in a huddle, smoking and talking. I didn't really notice this. I was just perfecting my walk, watching myself in the large mirror attached to one wall. Just as the character was starting to work for me, Rob walked up and said, The Scandinavian stuff. I said, Yeah, yeah, it feels really good. No, said Rob. It's going to drive people insane. That voice really gets you after a while. 
What about American? Yeah, American, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, American, no, yeah, yeah, no, said Doug. It made some sense in some ways. A robot was far more likely to come from America than Sweden. You can see here how strongly I hold on to my opinions. I don't swim with the tide. I stick to my beliefs. Sometimes, for a bit, as long as everyone likes me. I did my Californian, my bland Midwest. They're all a bit dull. Then I explained that I'd spent some time in Vancouver a few years before, having sex with a blonde Canadian woman in funny positions in various natural woodland settings. Not that the sex was important to the accent, although her accent was great. It was a sort of American-Swedish. Canadians have a very similar sing-song quality, and West Coast Canadians have a very peculiar vowel sound, which I believe is strongly influenced by Scottish people who settled there about a hundred years or so ago. I tried the walk again. Now with a distorted Canadian accent. Ew, hello there, Mr. David, sir. I have your breakfast, just as you ordered it. That was it. In some ways, Crichton, as I portray him, was born at that moment. Obviously, when I finally had the whole costume on, the walk changed. The arm movements were defined by what I could and couldn't do. But the voice is more or less the same. However, there is no rest for the egotistical, and no sooner was I riding the crest of a comedy wave in the rehearsal room than Beth Ann Jones led me into a little side room, sat me on a chair, and slipped back my hair. This is the first stage in the makeup procedure. I was having the first test of Crichton's head. Next came the bald cap, like a thin bathing cap that stuck to the skin with glue all around the hairline to hold it in place. Then the worst bit, the mask. A one-piece moulded balaclava of latex foam was pulled over my head like a giant split condom. First they glued the rear section onto the back of my head. Then, starting with the forehead, they glued the mask to my face. Glue all over my nose, cheeks, lips, chin, neck and ears. In fact, more or less everywhere except my eyelids. I looked in a mirror and saw a very odd spectacle. The mask was unpainted and looked the same colour as a band-aid you might find floating in a swimming pool. A sort of dirty grey beige colour. The skin around my eyes looked very dark, so I could still, as it were, see myself under the rubber. Rob, Ed and Doug came in and stood around looking at it. Beth Ann Jones explained everything about the mask's difficulties to them. Rob smiled and smoked. Doug said, Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Ed by said, Well, chap, what's it like? I don't know what I said. I think we discussed the theory of irony. I said that it was ironic how when I first met them, I was worried about being recognised for being a robot, worried about getting typecast. Here I was, so well covered in prosthetic foam, even my own mother wouldn't recognise me. After about 20 minutes, Beth Ann Jones removed the mask and I was back to normal. Even that early on, a huge relief washed over me when the thing finally came off. I washed my face and felt it carefully with my hands. It felt new and different, even after such a short time. I made a mental note of the amount of days before the next mask was being applied, ready for the first day's filming, which was to take place in Liverpool.